Right guys, and a half all year, so we slot all year, we should be down in 406, but for this week, I believe Alan down and he's going to, we're going to switch next. around the assessment. The assessment is two exam papers, each of one hour and one assignment. Okay? The assignment is a lab report to assess learning outcome two, attenuators and filters. So we'll spend about half of this semester getting the, so I'll teach you about attenuators and filters in the next two weeks. Then we'll have a period of time where the lab equipment and the software will be available for you to do the lab work experiment, get your results, do any simulation work that you need to do, okay? You'll then have a period of time after that where that teaching's finished for you to write up a professional lab report and hand it in. I can't remember what the handing date is off the top of my head at the moment, but when I give you the brief, which may well be, it might even be next week, um, You'll, you'll know when the hand-in date is. It's, it's Christmas time, okay? So you have plenty of time to write that report. After that, we will move on. So about halfway through this semester, we'll do the teaching around learning outcome one, which is the circuit theorems, AC and DC circuit calculations, okay? Um, you'll expected, be expected to remember basic Ohm's law and power calculations and so on, we'll be moving on from that. But essentially, Ohm's law is what we're going to be using, all right? But, but some more complex techniques so that we can examine circuits that have got more than one source in them. So two batteries, three batteries, so on, okay? Paper one exam covering those circuit theorems will be taken in the ex three-week exam period during January. Okay, exact, a whole, the whole sheet with all the exams is imminent. Then, begin the semester, so we'll spend 12 weeks doing the teaching around complex waveforms, um, and the PLUS transforms for an examination in the three exam weeks towards the end of May, beginning of June. Okay? So that's, that's the overall plan for this module, how it all fits into the year. All right? So, introduction to learn an outcome two. You're going to investigate the performance of two port networks, design, test, an attenuator, and a filter circuit against computer model and simulation. Okay, so what you'll do for each of those circuits is you'll come up with an ideal design. You'll be given a specification for an attenuator and specification 
for a filter. You'll come up with the ideal design solution. Then you'll select preferred value components because they don't make 113.6 ohm resistors, if that's what you need. So you pick the nearest value to that. You then simulate your preferred value circuit and see what the computer simulation tells you you should be getting. Okay, then you'll build that circuit with those value components that have a tolerance of resistor wise plus or minus 5%, capacitor as in inductors plus or minus 10, 20%, Chris, depending on, depending on construction. So you're not going to get, you're certainly not going to get your um, ideal output. You're not even going to get what your computer predicted. But is it a valid prediction? Is it close enough within component tolerances to be a worthwhile design tool in terms of coming up with a reasonable design for what you're looking for? Okay, so you're going from what's ideal to what the computer simulation says you're going to get with the components you choose to what you actually get when you build that circuit for real. And you'll write a lab report, a two-part lab report for each of those for each of those circuits. Okay? Right. So as I've just said, you're going to design an attenuator to give a specification, design a filter to give a specification, simulate the two circuits. You're going to use multi-sim to simulate your output, your attenuator. You're going to use a piece of software called LC, which is freely downloadable, so you can put it on your own machines to do both your filter design and simulation. Okay, and then you're going to build the circuits on our little plug-in boards, actually connect an oscilloscope and a source and analyze what you actually get in real life. Okay? Any questions so far? Right, so two port networks, basics. Two port network is a network and in, in terms of the attenuator, it's a network of resistors. In terms of a filter, it's a network of um, capacitors and inductors with a resistive load in the case of what we're doing. But it uh, carries out some function upon an input and provides an output. So it has a input port of two terminals. The network itself does a function, does something to that input, and provides an output port on two terminals. So examples, voltage reduction and attenuator. So we might want to put 0 to 10 volts on the input and get an output that goes from 0 to 5 volts. So 0 volts in, 0 volts out, 10 volts in, it's 5 volts out. So it's effectively dividing the input by 2. We can have two port networks that change the signal type. So converts a 0 to 5 volt DC, for instance, into a 4 to 20 milliamp output. So signal conversion. You can even go to the stage where you've got a converter that converts a 4 to 20 milliamp current signal into a 0 to 15 PSI pressure output still really a two-port network. All right. A filter example is we have an AC variable frequency and a, and a two-port network that filters out all the frequencies that are above 20 kilohertz. So what comes out of it are all the frequencies below 20 kilohertz Anything above that is, is filtered or attenuated. Okay, so you're going to build one of these circuits, a voltage regular reduction or attenuator, and you're going to build a filter, either a, what's called a high pass, where it allows high frequencies through and cuts out all the lower ones, or alternatively low pass, where it allows low pass 
low frequencies through and high frequencies are attenuated. So, our attenuator. The attenuator has to fulfill three basic conditions. First of all, it needs to have the correct input impedance, called the Z-in. Having the correct input impedance means that the maximum power is transferred from the source item, the voltage coming in, to into the attenuator, so you don't get a power loss there. So you're matching the input, the output impedance of the device to the input impedance of the attenuator. More detail about that soon. It also has to have the correct output impedance, called the Z-out. This ensures that you transfer the maximum power from the attenuator into the load the device you want to run. So for instance, this could be an attenuator where you've got a sensor that gives you a 0 to 10 volt signal between um, pressures input of 0 to 100 bar, for instance, and you've got an instrument you want to connect that to that requires a 0 to 5 volt input. Yeah. So you put an attenuator between the two to attenuate that signal lower the level. Right. Thirdly, it has to provide a specific attenuation level, voltage, current or power. That is, in our specification I just talked about, we've got to reduce 10 volts down to 5, so you've got to produce an attenuation level that effectively halves what you're putting in onto the output. The third condition Okay, and this, this attenuation level has to be independent of frequency. So it mustn't be affected by frequency. So an attenuator will have per resistance only. There will only be resistors. No active components like inductors or capacitors in an attenuator. As soon as you add them, you've got a filter. Okay. So there are three things that we have to concentrate on when we want to design our attenuator is that we've got the correct input and output impedances and that we're designed for the desired attenuation level. So let's have a look at what we mean by each of these things. Correct input impedance. Here's our device some kind of sensor giving us an output. It will have a specified output impedance. That's the impedance of the source. We have to make sure that the input impedance of our attenuator network with the ideal load connected is equal to the output impedance of that device. So this, if that's a 500 ohm output impedance, we need to make our input impedance of our attenuator. That is what we would measure with an ohm meter if we connected it across these two terminals with the load connected, ideal load, whatever that is. They need to match each other for best performance. Okay? What you'll find with your designs is you'll not get it perfect, but you'll be able to get it close. Okay? So that's what's meant by having the correct input impedance. That you're matching the input impedance of the attenuator to the output impedance of the source. Secondly, what do we mean by correct output impedance. Well, that means the, a similar thing. We've got the Z out of the attenuator with the impedance of the source connected. So this is 
for example, that 500 ohm output impedance sensor that we had connected in the previous example. So we got that connected. When we put an ohm meter on here, we measure the same resistance as the resistance of this load, let's say 600 ohms. That's best matching. So we're trying to match the impedance of the load with the output impedance of the attenuator. And the closer we get that matching, the closer we'll be to the performance that we require. Yeah? Because what will happen is, if we take our design and we go on 0 to 10 volts input, we want that to match to 0 to 5 volts output. And what will happen if it's not matched properly is we won't get 1 volt equaling half a volt, 2 volts equaling 1 volt and so on. It won't be linear across the range if we don't get the matching right or as close as possible. Because we're looking at the same attenuation amount at all points at any other values that could possibly be input there. An example of this, not necessarily from our areas of engineering, but in the world of audio equipment, you may well have seen that speakers have got an impedance and your, your, output, your amplifier on your hi-fi has got an output impedance. If you don't match them, you won't get the rate of power from the system. So if you connect 16 ohm impedance speakers to an 8 ohm amplifier output, you won't, you won't transfer all of that amplifier power to those speakers. All right. Slightly different because we're talking about an AC signal and therefore it's affected by frequency. So what they do is they quote those, those impedances relative to a thousand a signal of a thousand hertz. So they give it a they give it a frequency base as well. Okay. Right. Any questions up to that point? So you all understand what input and output impedance means. You match the input the, the device that you're going to connect to the input, Dom, will be like some kind of sensor that's got its own internal impedance. It will be specified on the spec sheet. Let's say 500 ohms. 500 ohms and 1,000 ohms are quite common in instrumentation. So you need to have an input to your attenuator that measures 500 ohms when you connect the impedance of your instrument to the output of the attenuator. Maybe this will help. I mean, I'll just so here's. Let's say we've got a sensor here of some sort. It's got its own voltage generator and internal impedance, 500 ohms. Yeah. The idea is that you connect that to a, to an attenuator network. It has 500 ohm input when the output device is connected. Yeah? But that don't necessarily have to be 500 ohm. That could be 1,000 ohm. Yeah? But then in that case, what you'd want is looking in here with this disconnected in that case and that connected, you'd want to see a thousand ohms looking in there to correctly match both ends. Okay? You're, you're going to be building an attenuator that's got the same input and output impedance, by the way, not one that's got different. Alright? But you can have them where that's different. Okay? 
we'll talk about about that in a minute. All right. And that's usually the thing that the students find most difficult to get because you're talking about the output impedance of that device connected with the input impedance of that. The input impedance of the instrument is connected to the output impedance of the attenuator. Yep. Right, so what's called unbalanced attenuators? Unbalanced attenuators, and you are going to be building unbalanced attenuators, by the way, are where the sh these are used where the signal is a voltage above or below a common rail. So like 0 volts, 10 volts, I put 0 volts to 5 volts. All right, or it could be currents. But there's a common, a rail with no components in it other than a piece of wire and everything connected down to that. All right. So you, for a start, you're going to be building um, an unbalanced attenuator. Then we have two types, a T-type, which has got two series resistors. and a parallel right, and because of some the, the attenuator design system I'm going to get you to use they call that the shunt resistor it's an old term for parallel I've seen shunt the pi type the Americans call this the Y by the way because they like doing things different yeah. And this one's called the pi because it looks like the pi symbol. As in, I don't know what they call that one. Probably call it something different. I don't know, the castle type. I don't, know. I don't think they do, actually. So in that, we've got one series and two shunts, so two parallels. Yeah. I know of no particular reason why you'd choose one over the other. Um, other than maybe the components you've got available. But I don't, there is in the filters, because the filters are going to have either a pi or t-type design, and you can do either in both high pass and low pass. But what we go for is the design that's only got one inductor, because that way... So, if we choose that to be the inductor, or we choose that to be the inductor. So, over high pass and low pass, you choose the design one inductor, because inductors are quite big, and they take up more real estate on your printed circuit board than, than your average capacitor. And they interfere with each other, and they're more expensive. Okay? So, but we would tend to... We will, in, in essence of the practical you're going to do, we'll, we will make you use the design that only uses one, one um, inductor. Having said that, we might have to ask you to put two in parallel or series to make up a get close to a particular value. But that's just, put in, in real life you choose the one with a single inductor and you get an inductor made close to what you want it to be. We used to make wind them, didn't we, own. Chris? Wind your own, okay? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So that there are, in attenuators, I know of no real reason, but your component values would be completely different for the same attenuation level and input and output impedance. So there might be an issue as to why you choose one over the other for component value reason. All right. Then, and you're not going to build these, and we're not going to do too much around them, but balanced attenuators. This is where you would um, have a signal that has no common rail, i.e. it's between plus 5 volts and minus 5 volts. 
what we're doing there is taking so the comp the overall values of these Z1, Z2, Z3 components would be the same, but you're putting half of the Z1 component in the bottom rail and half of the Z3 component in the bottom rail as well, and you're keeping the shunt component the same. And similar for the T-type, the two shunt components are the same, but you put half the series resistance in the top and half the series resistance in the bottom. Pass over two. So your calculations would be the same, Jake, but you just spread that. So, you, so you st if that was calculated in in the in the unbalanced type as 100 ohms, you'd take that 100 ohms. You put 50 there and 50 there. Yeah. Okay. You're not going to build one of them anyway. They're in the notes for completeness. Right. There's two, so, so already you've got four different things because you've got pi and t-type in both balanced and unbalanced. Now even more confusion reigns because we need to talk about symmetrical, which you're going to build, and asymmetrical attenuators. Symmetrical attenuators are attenuators that have the same input and output impedance. So... 500 ohm in, 500 ohm out. That's what you're going to build. So in, because they're symmetrical, in either design, Z1 and Z3 will be the same value. So your series resistors in the T-type, if Z1's 100 ohms, Z3 will also be 100 ohms, but Z2 will likely be different. Same as in the pi type, your Z1 and Z3 shunt resistors will be the same, but the series resistor will be different. There's a special name for that single impedance. It's called a characteristic impedance, ZO, of the um, symmetrical attenuator. So this is they're used where the impedance of the source device connected to the input is the same as the impedance of the load the device connected to the output. What you're going to be connecting to the output is um, a dummy resistor, okay, of a particular value, and what you're going to be connecting to the input is a signal generator that has selectable 50 ohm or 600 ohm output. Yep. So. You, you, you'll be given that in the specification. So you're all going to have different design specifications. And it'll specify whether you're using, whether you're doing a pi design or a T design, and what your input and output impedance is. So you're going to build a symmetrical, unbalanced attenuator. All right? Now, again for completeness, oh, hang on. Yes, yeah, all DC, this is. Uh, oh, well, these will do AC. You know, you can use AC as well. And you're going to be using AC signals. All right? Because, because we want to prove with your attenuator, Lewis, but we want to prove that if you change the frequency, it doesn't affect the output. Yeah? So in your, when you take your results, you're going to try different voltage level inputs and see what output you get but you're also going to vary the frequency over two or three different frequencies to prove that when you put 10 volts in, you still get 5 volts out, for instance. Unaffected by frequency. Yeah? I thought I had to... Just briefly, there isn't a slide on them. The other type are called asymmetrical. Again, there are pi and t-type designs. <coughs> And they're the type where the input and output impedance aren't the same. So if you've got a 500 ohm sensor and you want to connect it to a 1000 ohm instrument, you can put an attenuator between the two to match them. The only issue there is, is that you're going to get at least a certain amount of attenuation whether you want it or not because of the different matching. Okay? So there's a um, minimum design loss, I think they call it, 
where you're going to get that attenuation even if you didn't want it. Okay? You don't have to worry about that because we're not building one that has to match a mismatched source anyway. Okay? So, calculating the characteristic impedance of a symmetrical T design. we can do is if we have the Z in alright and we've not got the component values this is coming to this from a slightly different angle because what we actually want to do is design for a given input impedance output impedance and attenuation but if you had an attenuator there and you knew what the Z1, Z2, Z3 components are you can calculate the um, characteristic impedance using that formula. Okay. What's that? No, that's Z1 squared. Yeah. So let's, for example, if you had an attenuator where these two are 100, and that one was a thousand. Yeah, you can calculate the characteristic impedance Z O by the square root of a hundred squared plus two times a thousand times a hundred. If someone would like to push some buttons, we'll get an answer. So, same component values, completely different. That look a bit high to me. <laughs> you didn't square root with it. <laughs> That's better. 91.7. 91.8. Around there. So, same components, completely different input and output impedance. Yep. Yeah. That's what you would expect. I know of no particular benefit other than if you if if you got certain components and ain't got other values. Yeah. There might be there might be a current flow issue, maybe, or a power issue through through this resistor, because you're directly if that's a low value, you're gonna drive a lot of current just straight down a down to nothing. Yes. Because naturally that because it's be yeah. yeah. There you go. So if you if you're looking for particularly high impedance, you're going to get it easier with with the series than you are with the with with the double shunt one. That's naturally going to be a bit lower for the same components. All right. Yeah. If you if you're looking for a particularly high impedance, then T might well be the way to go. Okay. You can also Calculate the ZO from information on the. So if you take the attenuator, and this is the way, and I know you, this is what Lewis used to do. Here's an attenuator with an unknown value, and that was one of the adjustable ones, I think, wasn't it? Covered up the values and said, do this open and closed circuit test and determine the, the, the characteristic impedance of this attenuator. So what you do is, you can measure with an ohm meter the open circuit 
input impedance. So open circuit means nothing connected to the output. And then measure a short circuit. So we put a piece of wire across the output terminals and again connect an ohm meter to there. And then you can use um, those values in this formula. So ZO is the square root of the open circuit impedance multiplied by the short circuit impedance. So there's a practical way to find out what the characteristic impedance of a, an attenuator where there's no markings on it, okay, or the markings have been rubbed away, etc. Okay, and you know from science in your first year you had to go at determining the values of some unknown components in terms of a capacitor and a and a inductor. So quite often there is a practical way of determining values of components. Yeah? Using electrical theory and so on. So you'd have the this will allow you to find the um, characteristic impedance of an unknown practical symmetrical attenuator using the instruments. However, it's more likely that we need to design for a particular level of attenuation and have a specific input and output impedance. So that's going to be your specification. 10 dBs of attenuation, I'll more about that in a minute, and an input and output impedance of either 50 ohms or 600 ohms in your cases. So, what we need to do is look at how we're going to how generally you specify attenuation and or gain. Right? Attenuation factor or ratio. That is a general symbol for an amplifier. Yeah? It's got a V in and a V out. And if we divide the output voltage by the input voltage, we end up with a term called the gain on our amplifier. Okay, so if we put 1 volt in and we get 10 volts out, the gain is 10. So ratio, it has no units. If V out is smaller than V in, the gain will be less than 1. And that's actually a loss or attenuation. Yeah. So if we put 10 volts in and get 5 volts out, we're doing 5 over 10. The gain is 0 0.5. Less than 1, that means attenuation. Equally, we are able, if we need to, to calculate the current gain or the power gain or attenuation factor in certain instances. Okay? And in your attenuated design software that you're going to use online, it requires you to specify your attenuation level in power gain form. Right? More about that in a little while. So, measuring gain and attenuation using the decibel or dB scale. In many cases, gain or loss in circuits, the numbers involved are very large or very small. An amplifier can easily have a gain of 100,000 or more. We're talking about amplifying really small signals from instruments, for instance convenience, it's better to use a logarithmic scale. If logs to the base 10 are used, and the ratio is said to be in bells, this is a large unit, and it's more commonly to use the decibel, or dB. With 10 dB equaling 1 bell. Now, we get the power ratio in dB by taking 10 times the log of P out of a PN. Yeah? 
So that's how we work out what the power ratio is in dB from the power we're putting in in watts divided by uh, uh, power coming out in watts divided by the power in in watts. All right. We'll look at some examples in a minute. If either the voltage or current ratios are available, power bit dB can be found using one of these two formulas. So what we've done, what I've done here, is replaced P out with the formula for power involving voltage. So V squared <laughs> divided by Z. Yeah. V in, or power in, is replaced by V in squared divided by Z in. All right. Alternatively, if you know the currents input and out, you can use I squared out times Z out, I squared in times Z in. Your specification is going to need, involve you needing to use one of those two formulas to calculate your attenuation level in power dB so that you can use the software. So one of those two formulas is going to be useful to you. All right. Examples. If P out of a P in is equal to 1, i.e. we put the same, we get the same voltage output as we put in, you might think what is the use of that, but it does have its uses, called a buffer. Yeah. And that would have a dB ratio of zero. If P out of a P in is 100, i.e. greater than 1, dB ratio is plus 20 dB. That's a gain or amplification. If P out of a P in is less than 1, we get a negative value for dB, minus 10 dB. When the value of the ratio is negative, we're talking about a loss or a circuit that is attenuating. Yeah. So what we're saying there is we've got minus 10 BD, dB gain plus 10 BD, 10 dB attenuation. And that's always confusing. When you talk about that as attenuation, you strip the negative sign off. It's minus 10 dB gain positive 10 bit dB attenuation. So be careful. A buffer, if you, if you would, an example I can think of is if you're sending a signal over long distances, you'll get a drop. So you can put a buffer along the line to keep that signal up. Is that a good example, Chris? Yeah. You can think of any other? Yes. Yes. So if you can, if you, if you, if you're trying to match impedances, what you're gonna, what, and you're gonna supply a low impedance, you're gonna draw a lot of current. So this buffer will help to, to keep that, keep the voltage up, and allow you to supply that high current. So. Yes. You're not going to be building a buffer, by the way, but um, anyway. If, if you are working with voltage or current ratios, you can get the current ratio dB from 20, notice it's changed from 10 to 20, times the log of I out of I in, and the voltage ratio from 20 times the log of V out and V in. All right. Yes. It does. Yeah. Yeah. So what we're going to have to do is look at a um, 
problem definition that is close to, similar to what you're going to be doing um, for your assignment. Obviously, none of you are being given these values. All right. So, a pressure sensor produces a signal of 0 to 20 volts across a rated pressure range when connected to a load of impedance 500 ohms. So, this sensor is designed to be connected to a 500 ohm load. You need to connect it to an instrument that requires an input voltage between 0 and 10 volts. So, we, we got 0 to 20, we want 0 to 10. So, we've effectively got a half the voltage, we've got a attenuate by half. An input impedance of 500 ohms. This can be achieved with a passive attenuator made from simple resistors. So, calculating the component values. So we're going to go. We're going through now the manual way on a piece of paper of finding out the values of Z1, Z2, and Z3. Okay, for a T-type attenuator. First thing we need to do is find the, attenua the attenuation factor called N. So we've got three formulas we can get up from V in over V out, I in over I out, or the square root of P in over P out. So here N is equal to V in 20 volts divided by V out, 10 volts, equals 2. So N is 2. Yeah? We've been given our ZO, 500 ohms of ZO. Yeah? So we can now use this, this formula, formula down here to calculate Z1 and Z2. So I'll give you to do that now. In fact, I'll tell you what, 3 here, um, no, that's all right, I'll do the same. I was, got to get, I was thinking of doing some of you doing the pi type, but we'll do that after. Just calculate your values for Z1 and Z2. Right, what values we got for Z1? Just for you, Dom, two thirds. <laughs> and for Z2? Okay. So they are ideal values. If we could get those exact values, then we'd have exactly 500 ohm input and output impedance and we cut the voltage exactly in half from input to output. Okay. Yep. Right. Just repeat that exercise. So on there, got the formulae for an N is going to stay the same. Still V in of a V out. Two. But calculate the values for a pi type. Let me phrase the board right now. Right guys, what we got? Z1? Ben, you got a value for me? Fifteen hundred. Everyone agree with that? And Z two, Jasmine. Three seven five. Everyone agree with that? Yeah. So that if again, if you got those two two exact values, put them in a circuit in a pi design, you'd have exactly five hundred input and output impedance and you cut your voltage exactly in half. Okay? 
So, what we're going to do now is just take a, a look at um, how we're going to use the um, an online calculator to, to as an alternative to the manual calculations. So that's the manual way. We're going to look at an online calculator. First thing we need to do is check out what our attenuation level is in power dB. So look back at the notes. I want to calculate the attenuation level in power dB. Bearing in mind that you know V in and V out. So what do I need to put in those brackets then? N squared over 500. Yeah, V out squared over Z out. Yep, and the answer is, so 10 times the log of that lot. Sorry? Minus 6, but we're talking about it. that indicates a negative gain. So there's an attenuation level of 6 dB attenuation. So to calculate, you need to strip the negative value off. All right? Got a gain of six, minus 6 dB. So it's got an attenuation of plus 6 dB. All right? Yeah, if you get a negative gain, that's a positive attenuation. What I'm going to take you to now 